Okay. Our second panel is on doctor, nurse, hospital, and other provider views. And as you can see, it's a rather large panel. So we want to get started. And let me, uh, I don't think I've seen such a large panel. We'll start on my left with Dr. Ted Epperly, who is president of the American Academy of Family Physicians. And then we have uh, Dr. M. Todd Williamson, who is president of the Medical Association of Georgia. Uh, and then is uh, Dr. Carl Ulrich, who is clinical president and CEO of the Marshfield Clinic. And Dr. Janet Wright, who is vice president of science and quality at the American College of Cardiology. Dr. Kathleen White, who is chair of the Congress on Nursing Practice and Economics at the American Nurses Association. Um, Dr. Gabo, okay. <laughs> Dr. Patricia Gabo, who is Chief Executive Officer of the Denver Health and Hospital Authority for the National Association, well, she'll be speaking for the National Association of Public Hospitals. Dan Hawkins, who is Senior Vice President, Public Policy and Research for the National Association of Community Health Centers. And Bruce Roberts, who is Executive Vice President and CEO of the National Community Pharmacists Association. Bruce Yarwood, President and CEO of the American Healthcare Association. And Alyssa Fox, who is Senior Vice President of the Office of Policy and Representation for the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association. Now, before we begin, I just wanted to make um, uh, point something out um, that I believe has been shared with staff, but I think needs to be repeated because of the panel. Uh, it would touch upon some of the things particular with regard to uh, um, community health centers. In several sections of um, the draft, well, I should say, in several sections of that part of the draft that deals with the public health and workforce develop development in that division, a sentence that was supposed to be in addition to current authorizations was instead drafted to take the place of them. So instead of in addition, it says to take the place of in that division. And this is an error. It was caught on Friday afternoon, uh, shortly after the draft was announced, and we did uh, notify both Democrat and Republican committee staff of the mistake, um, and corrections have been sent to the Office of Legislative Counsel. But I did want to point that out before I started here today, because I wasn't sure that all of you who are testifying were aware of that. Uh, the mistake is particularly glaring in the provision related to community health centers. And I think Mr. Hawkins knows this, but just let me pen it at, point it out to everyone that the draft is supposed to include an additional $12 billion over five years in new money, and that's over and above the current appropriation. And um, again, that's why we have drafts, I guess. But let us start. As you know, we ask you to keep your comments, your uh, oral comments to five minutes, and of course, all of your written testimony will be uh, included in the, in the uh, record, and we'll start with uh, Dr. Epperly. Chairman Pallone, Ranking Member Deal, and members of the Energy and Commerce Health Civil Committee. I'm Ted Epperly, President of the American Academy of Family Phys Physicians, which represents 94,600 members across the United States. I'm a practicing family physician from Boise, Idaho. I'm delighted to say that your draft bill goes a long way towards providing quality, affordable health care coverage for everyone in the United States. The AAFP has called for fundamental reform of our health care system for over two decades. We commend you for your leadership and commitment to find solutions to this complex national priority. We appreciate efforts to improve primary care through this draft bill. The Academy believes that making primary care the foundation of health care in this country is critical. Primary care is the only form of health delivery charged with the long-term care of the whole person and has the most effect on health care outcomes. Primary care is performed and managed by a personal physician leading a team collaborating with other health professionals, and using consultation or referral as needed. Many studies demonstrate that primary care is high quality and cost effective because it includes coordination and integration of health care services. The Academy believes the key to designing a new health care system is to emphasize the centrality of primary care by including the patient-centered medical home where every patient has a personal physician, emphasizing cognitive clinical decision-making rather than procedures, 
and ensuring the adequacy of our primary care workforce, and aligning incentives to embrace value over volume. Many of these key provisions are contained in your draft legislation. Specifically, we applaud the committee for including a medical home pilot program in Medicare as a step towards a primary care system. Your definition of the patient-centered medical home is consistent with the one established by the AAFP and other primary care organizations. We also support the PCMH demonstration project in Medicaid. Use of the medical home will achieve savings and improve quality. We appreciate the inclusion of a bonus of 5% for primary care services and up to 10% for services provided in a health profession shortage area. We urge you to make this bonus permanent. Medicare is a critical component of the U.S. health system and must be preserved and protected. With this draft, you take the first bold steps needed to remedy the Medicare physician payment system. The AAFP appreciates your recognition of the long-standing problems with the dysfunctional formula known as the Sustainable Growth Rate, or SGR. We thank you for proposing that it be, be, that it be rebased. This is an important, necessary, and welcome step. We also appreciate the bill's attention to workforce issues. Numerous studies indicate that more Americans depend on family physicians than on, uh, than on any other medical specialty. We are deeply concerned about the decline in the number of medical students pursuing a career in primary care at a time when the demand for primary care services will only be increasing. The majority of health care is provided in physicians' offices now and will be in the future. We must revitalize the programs to train the primary care physician workforce that will meet our needs in those locations. We thank you for reauthorizing and providing a substantial investment in the Section 747 of the Health Professions Primary Care Medicine Training Program. The National Health Care Workforce Commission in the discussion draft is needed to recommend the appropriate numbers and distribution of, of physicians. The AAFP is also pleased that the Medicaid title provides for a substantial expansion of coverage to the uninsured. In particular, we support increases to the Medicaid primary care payment so that it is equal to Medicare by 2012. The AAFP supports a public plan option consistent with the principles included in our written testimony. Patients should have a choice of health plans, and a public plan should be one of them. However, the public plan should not be Medicare. We acknowledge that for transition purposes, there may be some similarities to the federal program, but we urge Congress to delink the public plan for Medicare by a date certain. The AAFP strongly supports the inclusion of comparative effectiveness research in the draft bill. We appreciate the establishment of a center within the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. If we wish to improve the patient care and control costs in this country, this type of research is crucial. It is only with CER that we can provide evidence-based information to patients and physicians for use in making health care decisions. Finally, we support a number of insurance market changes that will help our patients in regards to the health insurance exchange where they can one-stop shop for a health care plan, a sliding scale subsidy so that people can purchase meaningful coverage, guaranteed availability and renewability of coverage, prohi prohibition of pre-existing conditions, exclusions and denials, and benefit packages that allow consumers to select the one that best meets their needs as well as a requirement for a core set of benefits. In conclusion, the Academy believes that health care should be a shared responsibility and applauds the section of the bill that requires all individuals have coverage. Now is the time to provide affordable, high-quality health care coverage. The status quo is not working. We urge Congress to invest in the health care system we want, not the one we have. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Epperly. Dr. Williamson. Good morning, Chairman Pallone and Mr. Deal. My name is Todd Williamson, and I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. I'm a neurologist from Atlanta, and I serve as the president of the Medical Association of Georgia, and I'm speaking on behalf of that association. I recently had the privilege of speaking on behalf of a coalition of 20 state and specialty medical societies representing more than 100,000 physicians, which is nearly half of the practicing physicians in the United States. This coalition believes that ensuring the patient's right to privately contract with their physician is the single most important step we could take to reform our medical care system. I would like to begin by addressing three assumptions that underpin the discussion draft. The first relates to geographic disparities in spending. Peter Orzag recently said that nearly 30% of Medicare's costs could be saved without negatively affecting health outcomes 
if spending in high and medium cost areas could be reduced to the level in low cost areas. We do not agree. This flawed claim was first made by the Dartmouth Group, which used only Medicare data to analyze spending and quality. Please consider the work of Dr. Richard Cooper, which shows that an examination of total medical spending per capita reveals that quality and costs are indeed connected. He also demonstrates that Medicare payments are disproportionately higher in states with high poverty levels and low overall medical care spending. The suggestion that our medical care expenditures are greater than other countries is also misleading. Countries account for expenditures such as out-of-pocket payments and the cost of long-term care in different ways. Some countries drive down costs by rationing care. The cost of research and development distorts our expenditures as well. A third faulty assumption is that medical care outcomes in the United States are worse than in other countries. America's often cited infant mortality statistics cannot be co directly compared to statistics from other countries that do not record the deaths of low birth weight newborns that we try to save. Comparisons of a host of specific diseases such as diabetes clearly show our outcomes are superior. We cannot support and would actively oppose the discussion draft. As I noted, we believe that allowing patients and physicians to privately contract is the single most important step we can take towards reforming the nation's medical care system. This will empower patients to choose their physician, spend their own money on medical care, and make their own medical decisions. Medical expenditures can only be appropriately controlled and allocated where there is complete transparency and acknowledgement of necessity and value at the time of the patient-physician interaction. Private contracting will enhance access to medical care. Many physicians opt out of government plans because payments do not cover costs. If private contracting was allowed, every patient would have access to every doctor. This option is currently not available under government plans and is prohibited in the discussion draft. Critics cite that private contracting will disadvantage impoverished patients. I would argue that they will benefit from increased access and competition in the medical community and their physicians will be at liberty to waive copays, which is currently forbidden in government plans. We applaud the draft sponsors for planning to rebase the SGR payment system, but we remain concerned that they continue to rely on a target-based approach. We support the emphasis on prevention, wellness, and claims transparency. We agree that primary care should receive greater support and administrative burden should be reduced. We do not believe that the federal government should replace current research and development mechanisms or the training and judgment of physicians with federally controlled comparative effectiveness research. While we recognize the need for reform, we believe that the private marketplace should remain the primary means of obtaining insurance. A government-sponsored health insurance program for working age adults will invariably eliminate private options. Recall that Medicare was originally introduced as an option for seniors, but today it has essentially become their only choice. We can reduce obstacles to individual ownership and control of medical insurance by adopting new tax policies. This would eliminate the phenomenon of pre-existing conditions because individuals could carry their insurance with them for life, independent of their occupation or employer. To those who assert that the private sector has failed our patients, I say that our patients have been disadvantaged in the marketplace by a tax system that penalizes individual ownership of health insurance. When all Americans own their policies, insurance companies will be forced to compete for the business of millions of individuals, and they will focus on satisfying the patient, not the patient's employer. Finally, we can significantly reduce health care expenditures and improve access by enacting proven, effective medical liability reform measures. I appreciate this opportunity to present the views of practicing physicians to you today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williamson. Dr. Ulrich. Or is it Ulrich or Ulrich? Ulrich is good. Ulrich. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Deal, and members of the subcommittee, my name is Carl Ulrich, and I am President and CEO of Marshfield Clinic in Marshfield, Wisconsin. On behalf of myself, our staff, and the tens of thousands of patients that we care for, we commend you for advancing the national health reform debate. At our clinic, we continue to follow closely this dialogue, especially reorienting the system towards quality and efficiency, while at the same time ensuring that any meaningful reform is not built upon the flawed incentives of the current program. Therefore, we strongly urge this committee to be bold and address the problems of affordability, quality, and disparities in payment that plague the program, hurting beneficiaries and providers alike. As background, Marshfield Clinic is one of the largest medical group practices in Wisconsin and indeed the United States, with almost 800 physicians, 6,500 additional staff, and 3.6 million annual patient encounters per year. As a 501c3 not-for-profit organization, our clinic is a public trust, 
serving all who seek care regardless of their ability to pay. As part of our commitment, the clinic has invested in sophisticated tools that complement and support our mission, such as an internally developed certified electronic medical record, a data warehouse, and an immunization registry. With this infrastructure, the clinic is presently publicly reporting clinical outcomes and providing quality improvement tools to analyze processes, eliminate waste, and improve consistency while still reducing unnecessary costs. These uh, initiatives are consistent with the stated goals of the national health reform debate. Our clinic has long used information to facilitate care redesign, and we expanded these efforts after becoming a participant in the federal physician group practice demonstration. As a result, we have improved care, reduced costs, and achieved significant savings for the Medicare program. In the first two years of the demonstration, we have saved taxpayers more than $25 million with our redesigns, while meeting or exceeding all 27 of possible quality metrics. We believe that equivalent or even greater results are possible with the creation of the proposed accountable care organizations, especially if the subcommittee aligns the incentives of, Medi of the Medicare program reimbursement with value and efficiency. However, of concern is the current tri-committee mark the authors have proposed the establishment of a public health insurance option. Providers who voluntarily participate in Medicare would be required to participate in the public option and would be paid at Medicare rates plus some incremental percentage for the first three years of operation. This raises substantial financial and operational questions around how the federal government could compel physicians to see those patients. For instance, would this mean that patients must be seen when they present or would providers be compelled to see the patient within a certain time frame? Further, if the public plan pays at Medicare rates, the reduction in commercial service revenue would compel radical restructuring of our institution, perhaps resulting in our demise. As such, and in this current form, Marshfield Clinic strongly opposes the public, public plan alternative based on the belief that a true level playing field could never exist between public and private providers. In Wisconsin, where commercial rates vary between 180 to 280 percent of Medicare rates, this public plan would have such a profound competitive advantage uh, that one needs to be concerned that providers would uniformly abandon the Medicare program to survive in the practice of medicine. Further, there is a significant problem with Medicare payment rates in Wisconsin as well as the rest of rural America. For example, Medicare currently reimburses us at only 51.6% of our allowable costs. We believe that this is a result of Medicare's failed formulas for reimbursing physician work and practice expense and Medicare's geographic adjustment. To address these systemic problems, we believe that Congress and CMS must refine Medicare payment systems to address the problems of access and encourage appropriate care by providing incentives that focus on quality and efficiency. Similarly, we are also concerned about the practice expense components of the Medicare physician formula. It is widely agreed that the data used to estimate non-physician wages does not reflect current patterns in practice of medicine. As a result, the formula distorts payments, paying some too much and others too little. To resolve this disparity, we would like to heighten the legislative work of Congressman Braley and Kind, who have each authored uh, legislation to correct this inequity. And we urge the subcommittee to include these members as thoughtful provisions in any health care reform legislation that advances. Again, Marshfield Clinic appreciates the opportunity to share our views, and we look forward to advancing our shared vision of a healthy America. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Elbert. Dr. Wright. Chairman Pallone and Ranking Member Deal and members of the subcommittee, uh, thank you for the opportunity to appear before the subcommittee today. My name is Janet Wright. I'm a board-certified cardiologist, um, having trained in San Francisco and practiced in Northern California for 25 years. Um, I, for the last year, I've been serving as the American College of Cardiology's uh, Senior Vice President for Science and Quality here in Washington. And in that role, I oversee our registries, our scientific documents like guidelines and performance measures and appropriate use criteria, and also our quality improvement projects and programs. On behalf of the 37,000 members of the ACC, I commend you for setting out the health care reforms um, in the current draft bill. We see so many improvements, and we commend you and applaud your efforts to both attend to and correct the flawed physician payment model. Uh, we also register concerns about um, 
proposed cuts in imaging and the effect they may have on patients' access to care. But in, uh, in broad overview, the ACC is completely committed to comprehensive reform, and uh, we are very grateful for your attention to the matter. Uh, Ranking Member Barton invited me to speak today about his draft proposal, the Health Care Transparency Commission Act of 2009, and I'm delighted to offer these comments. The American College of Cardiology values performance measurement, its analysis and improvement, and it demonstrates this commitment through a 25-year history of producing guidelines uh, for clinical practice, the more recent generation of a particular kind of guidance called appropriate use criteria, to help clinicians choose the appropriate type of treatment or technology or procedure that best fits that patient's clinical scenario. And then our efforts in what's now called implementation science, taking what we know works and trying to get that into the practice of medicine in a systematic way. Examples of that in recent years are the Door to Balloon Project, the Alliance for Quality, over 1,100 hospitals here in the U.S. and beyond, uh, trying to shorten up that time from uh, diagnosis of a myocardial infarction until the balloon opens that artery. And more recently, we are about to launch a program called Hospital to Home, Excellence in Transition, along with key partnerships, particularly with the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. And finally, uh, we're beginning to implement our appropriate use criteria, both in imaging and soon in revascularization, to help clinicians, their patients, um, and their surgeons make good decisions about revascularization. Um, our, in fact, our vision is not just separate projects, but a network of practices and hospitals. We're currently in about 20, our registries are in about 2,300 hospitals around the country, and our ambulatory registry quality improvement program is just beginning, but we're out into about 600 practices in the country. Our fully realized vision is to connect these practices and hospitals in a quality network. Those individuals practicing in the hospitals and uh, outpatient settings are committed to the systematic delivery of scientifically sound patient-centered care and fully realize that vision will include primary care network as well because we understand most of cardiac disease is actually managed by primary care docs and nurses. In order to affect this vision, to make this come true, obviously payment needs to be readjusted from the volume that we've known to the value that we treasure. I uh, enlist and again appreciate your efforts to make that happen. And we believe that good data are the foundation for quality improvement and serve to stimulate innovation, very healthy competition amongst providers, and rapid and continuous learning network. As the science of performance measurement improves and the skill of all of us at, communi at communicating complicated statistics to lay people, as that skill is honed, consumers will likewise find great value in quality information. The ACC strongly supports the public's right to valid, actionable, and current data to help inform and enhance decision making. We find Mr. Barton's proposal to be a laudable one and should Congress proceed in this direction, we recommend consideration of the following principles. These were published in 2008, and I'm only going to hit the high points. Uh, but number one, these five principles. Number one, the driving force for performance measurement and public reporting should be quality improvement. We acknowledge and support Mr. Barton's critical inclusion in his draft bill of quality ratings along with pricing information. Number two, public reporting programs should be based on performance measures with scientific validity. Number three, public reporting programs should be developed in partnership with healthcare professionals, those being measured. Number four, every effort should be made to use standardized data elements to assess and report performance and to make the submission process uniform across all public reporting programs. This helps reduce the measurement fatigue and the disengagement that we often see in healthcare professionals who are exhausted with the effort of measuring. Number five, uh, performance reporting should occur at the appropriate level of accountability. I think this is true in all areas of medicine, but certainly in cardiology, the most effective care is delivered by teams. Focusing on an individual within that team may skew the measurement and the uh, result of that measurement in a way that has adverse consequences. Dr. Ryan, just, uh, you're almost a minute over, so oh, just, if you could just 
okay. summarize. Um, number six is uh, avoiding those unintended consequences. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, Dr. White. Your mic is not on. You have to turn that green light on and then bring the mic a little closer. Yeah. Chairman Pallone, Ranking yeah. Member Deal, distinguished committee members and congressional staff. I'm Kathleen White, a registered nurse speaking today on behalf of the American Nurses Association, and we thank you for this opportunity to testify. The ANA is the only full-service national association representing the interests of the nation's 2.9 million registered nurses in all educational and practice settings. ANA advances the nursing profession by fostering high standards of nursing practice. ANA commends the committee for its work in the Tri-Committee's draft legislation, which represents a movement toward much-needed, comprehensive, and meaningful reform for our health care system. We appreciate the committee's recognition that in order to meet our nation's health care needs, that we must have an integrated and well-resourced national workforce policy that fully recognizes the vital role of nurses and other health care providers and allows each to practice to the fullest extent of their scope. ANA remains committed to the principle that health care is a basic human right and all persons are entitled to ready access to affordable, quality health care services that are patient-centered, comprehensive, and accessible. We also support a restructured health care system that ensures universal access to a standard package of essential health care services for all. That is why ANA strongly supports the inclusion of a public health insurance plan option as an essential component of comprehensive health care reform. We believe that inclusion of a public plan option would assure that patient choice is a reality and not an empty promise, and that a high quality public plan option will above all provide the peace of mind that is missing from our current health care environment. It will guarantee the availability of quality, affordable coverage for individuals and families no matter what happens and generate needed competition in the insurance market. ANA looks forward to partnering with you to make this plan a reality. There are a wide variety of ideas currently circulating on health care reform, but all include discussion of prevention and screening, health education, chronic disease management, coordination of care, and the provision of community-based primary care. As the committee has clearly recognized in its drafts, these are precisely the professional skills and services that registered nurses bring to patient care. As the largest group of healthcare professionals, registered nurses are educated and practiced within a holistic framework that views the individual, family, and community as an interconnected system. Nurses are the backbone of the healthcare system and are fundamental to the critical shift needed in health services delivery, with the goal of transforming the current sick care system into a true health care system. ANA deeply appreciates the committee's recognition of the need to expand the nursing workforce and thanks you for your commitment to amend the Title VIII Nursing Workforce Development Programs under the Public Health Service Act and commend the inclusion of the definition of nurse-managed health centers under the Title VIII definitions. We applaud the removal of the 10% cap on doctoral traineeships under the Advanced Education Nursing Grant Program and the inclusion of special consideration to eligible entities that increase diversity among advanced educated nurses. Additionally, the expansion of the loan repayment program eligibility to include graduates who commit to serving as nurse faculty for two years will help address this critical shortage of both bedside nurses and nursing faculty. We're also grateful for the funding stream created through the Public Health Investment Fund and the commitment of dollars through 2014 that would offer vital resources and much needed funding stability for these Title VIII programs. ANA applauds the use of community-based multidisciplinary teams to support primary care through the medical home model. ANA is especially pleased that under this proposal, nurse practitioners have been recognized as primary care providers and authorized to lead medical homes. Nurse practitioners' skills and education, which emphasize patient and family-centered, whole-person care, make them particularly well-suited providers to lead in the medical home model, focused on coordinated chronic care management and wellness and prevention. Many recent studies have demonstrated what most healthcare consumers already know. Nursing care and quality patient care are inextricably linked in all care settings, but particularly in acute and long-term care. 
Because nursing care is fundamental to patient outcomes, we're pleased that the legislation places strong emphasis on reporting nurse staffing in long-term care settings, both publicly and to the secretary. The availability of nurse staffing information on the Nursing Home Compare website would be vital to help consumers make informed decisions, and the full data reported to the secretary will ensure staffing accountability and enhance resident safety. ANA hopes that in the same vein, the committee will look toward incorporating public reporting of similar nurse staffing measures and nursing sensitive indicators in acute care through the Hospital Compare website, as recommended by the National Quality Forum. Finally, a reformed healthcare system must value primary care and prevention to achieve improved health status of individuals, families, and the community. ANA supports the renewed focus on new and existing community-based programs, such as community health centers, nurse home visitation programs, and school-based clinics, and applauds the committee's recognition of the vital importance of addressing health disparities. Once again, the American Nurses Association thanks you for the opportunity to testify before this committee. We appreciate your understanding of the important role nurses play in the lives of our patients and the health system at large. Nurses are ready to work with you to support and advance meaningful health care reform today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. White. Dr. Cabot. Chairman Pallone, Ranking Member Deal, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify. I'm Dr. Patricia Gabo, and I'm speaking for Denver Health and the National Association of Public Health and Hospital System. Uh, please excuse my voice. Denver Health is an integrated safety net institution that includes the state's busiest hospitals, all Denver's federally qualified health centers, the public health department, all the school-based clinics, and more. Since 1991, we have provided $3.4 billion in uninsured care and have been in the black every year. We have state-of-the-art facilities and sophisticated HIT. These characteristics have enabled amazing quality. 92% of our children are immunized. Our hospital mortality is one of the lowest in the country. 61% of our patients have their blood pressure controlled compared to 34% in the country. This is despite the fact that 46% of our patients are uninsured, 70% are minorities, and 85% are below 100 185% of federal poverty level. So you may ask, if we are doing so well and meeting patients' needs, why am I here supporting health reform? The answer is straightforward. As a safety net physician leader, I see every day that America is failing to meet people's health care needs in a coordinated, high-quality, low-cost way. The number of uninsured at our door and the cost of their care increases every year. In 2007, our uninsured care was $275 million. Last year, it was $318 million and is projected to be $360 million this year. This is not sustainable. Moreover, not every American city has a Denver Health. As a doctor, I ask myself, why should where you live in America determine if you live? Why should an uninsured cancer patient get care if they live in Denver, but not if they live in another Colorado county? You have included important reform components in your draft bill. We support your goal to ensure affordable quality care for all. I agree that costs must be reduced if we are to cover everyone, and costs can be reduced by developing integrated systems that get patients to the right place at the right time with the right level of care, with the right provider, and the right financial incentives. We support your continued investment in DISH hospitals, community health centers, and public health. I would encourage incentives to move these separate entities to integrated systems. 
these entities will be important during the transition to full coverage and afterwards to vulnerable patients, including Medicaid, which will be a building block for much of the coverage expansion. Integrated systems are cost efficient. Our charges per Medicaid admission are 30% below our peer hospitals. Your investment in primary care and nurse training and the National Health Service Corps is critical. Without this, we will not be able to get patients to the right provider for the right level of care. As a public entity, we believe in the power of the public sector to meet the needs not only of those patients on public programs, but also private patients. We are the major Medicaid provider for our state, but our HMO also serves private patients, including Denver's mayors. We are, we and other safety net systems would welcome the opportunity to continue to be a plan of choice. In summary, as a physician and a CEO of a public safety net system, I urge you to continue this effort to substantially reform our delivery system, our payment model, and to provide care for all Americans. Our current system cannot and should not be sustained. America deserves better. I and NAPH are eager to help you in this very important task. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Mr. Hawkins. Well said, Dr. Gubo. <clears throat> Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Deal, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, distinguished uh, meaning president accounted for. <laughs> On behalf of the National Association of Community Health Centers, the nation's more than 1,200 community health center organizations, and the more than 18 million people they serve today, thank you for the opportunity to contribute to today's discussion. In community health centers all across the country, we witness the urgent need for fundamental health reform every single day in the faces and the struggles of our patients who for too long have been left behind by our dysfunctional health care system. Our 43 years experience in caring for America's medically disenfranchised and underserved has taught us three things. First and foremost, that health reform must achieve universal coverage that is available and affordable for everyone and especially for low-income individuals and families. Second, that that coverage must be comprehensive and must emphasize prevention and primary care. And third, that it must guarantee that everyone has access to a medical or a health care home where they can receive high quality, cost effective care for their needs. Mr. Chairman, we believe that the plan we have before us today meets those principles and also moves our nation much closer to achieving the equity and social justice in healthcare that has proven so elusive over the past century. Community health centers strongly support the draft legislation's call to expand Medicaid to cover everyone with incomes up to 133% of poverty without restriction. This Medicaid expansion may well be the most important and the most essential feature of this plan, especially for the patients we serve. At the same time, we urge you to ensure that as these Medicaid beneficiaries are potentially moved into the health insurance exchange, they can continue receiving as supplemental Medicaid benefits those key services like outreach, transportation, nutrition and, educa uh, and health education, screening and case management that will remain so vital to their health and well-being but will most likely not be covered by their exchange plans. It is also clear that the expansion of insurance coverage while a vital first step can only take the country so far. Most importantly, the increased demand for care that comes from expanding coverage must be met with an augmented primary health care system, as the people of Massachusetts learned in the wake of their state's reform. Here again, the draft legislation delivers a solid response to this challenge, and we applaud its call to expand the health center system of care through increased funding as part of the new Public Health Investment Fund. The members of this committee have consistently provided broad bipartisan support for health centers over the years, and we deeply appreciate that. And I can assure you that health centers are repaying your trust and your investment in them every day. 
For example, a recent national study done in collaboration with the Robert Graham Center found that people who use health centers as their usual source of care have 41 percent lower total health care costs and expenditures than people who get their care elsewhere. As a result, health centers saved the health care system $18 billion last year alone, more than nine times the federal appropriation for the program, and better than $2 for every dollar they spent in care. With the new funding in the draft bill, these savings will grow even larger. The National Health Service Corps is a vital tool for health in, uh, centers and underserved communities seeking to recruit new clinicians. And the draft legislation would bring an historic investment to the program, leading to thousands more primary care providers to practice in underserved communities. The committee has also historically recognized that it makes sense for all insurers to reimburse health centers and other safety net providers appropriately and predictably for the comprehensive primary and preventive care they provide. <clears throat> In order to accomplish this goal, we recommend that Congress uh, align health center payments from all insurers, public and private, with the structure currently in place under Medicaid. As you continue deliberations, we urge the committee to consider improving the bill further by including language from H.R. 1643, which would align the current Medicare health center payment methodology with the successful Medicaid prospective payment system. Finally, as full participants <clears throat> in a reformed health care system, America's health centers stand ready to deliver quality improvement, increased access, and cost containment that will be necessary to make this reform successful. To that end, we applaud the committee's inclusion of network adequacy standards for all exchange plans to ensure that people living in underserved communities have access to the health centers and other essential community providers located there. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, we again thank you for your leadership and your commitment to make health care reform work for all Americans, and we pledge ourselves to work with you to make that a reality this year. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hawkins. Mr. Roberts. Chairman Pallone, uh, Chair Congressman Deal, and members of the Health Subcommittee, I'm Bruce Roberts, the Executive Vice President and CEO of the National Community Pharmacist Association, NCPA. I'm a licensed pharmacist in the state of Virginia, and I've owned uh, four community pharmacies over the last 33 years in Loudoun County, Virginia. NCPA represents the owners and operators of 23,000 independent community pharmacies in the United States. We appreciate the opportunity to testify uh, for, before you today on the role of pharmacy in health care reform. In many communities throughout the United States, especially in urban and rural areas, independent community pharmacies are often the primary source of broad, a broad range of health care products and services. Services such as medication therapy management and immunization programs for seniors under Medicare Part B and D. We believe that a reformed health care system should expand the availability of these programs because they can help improve the quality of care and reduce health care cost. The reality is that for every dollar the health care system spends paying for prescription medications, we spend at least another additional dollar on health care services to treat the adverse effects of medications that are taken incorrectly or not at all. For example, a primary cause for costly hospital readmissions is the lack of patient adherence to medications used to treat chronic medical conditions such as hypertension and high, uh, high cholesterol. Pharmacists can play an important role in uh, the post-acute care in helping patients uh, manage their medications through education, training, and monitoring. We applaud the fact that the draft house language would allow the involvement of non physician practitioners such as pharmacists in the medical home pilot project. Pharmacists can help improve the use of prescription medications, especially in those individuals that have multiple chronic diseases. NCPA is very much appreciate very much appreciates the fact that that draft house legislation includes reform of the average manufacturer's price, AMP, based reimbursement system in, for Medicaid generic drugs. We would like to get this, fix, uh, this fixed this year. We are concerned that the Medicaid generic reimbursement at 130 percent of the weighted average AMP as proposed in the draft house bill combined with low dispensing fees paid by states will in total still significantly underpay pharmacies for the dispensing of low-cost generic 
generics in the Medicaid program. This could create a disincentive for the use of generic drugs, causing a rise in Medicaid cost over the long term. NCPA asked the committee to consider a higher FUL reimbursement rate for generic medications, especially for critical access community pharmacies that serve a higher percentage of Medi the Medicaid recipients or rural pharmacies. With respect to our ability to continue to provide durable medical equipment, DME, uh, to Medicare beneficiaries, we believe that the requiring, requiring state licensed, state supervised community retail pharmacies to obtain, obtain both accreditation and surety bonds to simply sell demipost items such as diabetes testing supplies to Medicare beneficiaries is basically overkill. Thousands of pharmacies across the country, mostly small pharmacies, will not be accredited at all or not be finished the accreditation process by October 1st, which will mean that they will be not be able to provide diabetes testing supplies for Medicare beneficiaries. We applaud the 90 bipartisan members of the House and 13 members of the Energy and Commerce Committee who supported H.R. 616, um, the bill that introduced, it was introduced by Congressman Barry and Congressman Moran that would exempt pharmacies from redundant and unnecessary accreditation requirements. We also appreciate the work of Congressman Space uh, in introducing H.R. 1970 which would exempt pharmacies from the unnecessary surety bonds. We ask that the provisions from these bills be included in the chairman's mark. If there is a willingness to exempt pharmacies from these requirements, we ask that Congress consider acting by October 1st, which is the deadline for providers to attain accreditation and surety bond. Finally, I would make a, a few comments regarding the public plan option. Under the House proposal, payment rates for prescription drugs under the public plan proposal would be negotiated by the Secretary. We would be very concerned, given this, giving the Secretary authority to set payment rates for prescription drugs without some basic guidance uh, to how these rates should be established and updated. We also ask that the language be clarified such as the administration of any benefit under the public plan would be accomplished by a pharmacy benefit administrator as opposed to a pharmacy benefit manager. We would prefer a model used in the Medicaid program or in the Department of Defense TRICARE program where the administrator is used. <clears throat> under this model, most if not all the negotiated drug manufacturer rebates would be passed through to the public program. In conclusion, we look forward to working with Congress and the administration to reform health care, the health care system, uh, uh, and we look forward to the opportunity to work with you to meet that end. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. Uh, Mr. Yarwood. Yes, sir. Am I on? There we go. Does that do it? Is the mic on? You have to... Huh? Or maybe bring it closer. Is the green light on? Is that, we got it? That's good. Okay, shoot. I'm afraid you'll hear me. <laughs> <laughs> I should first of all say thank you for including me in the distinguished panel. I'm going to doctor, 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 pharmacy, and here's old Yarwood sitting right in between them all. But thank you very much. I appreciate this being here. Uh, as you know, I'm Bruce Yarwood. I, uh, I'm president and CEO of the American Healthcare Association and National Center for Assisted Living, which we represent about 11,000 uh, facilities across the country. Uh, with a great cross-section you know, of the profession. We have big, we have small, we have rural, we have urban, uh, proprietary, non-proprietary. And uh, I would I'd be remiss if I didn't say uh, we look at ourselves as a pretty significant force in the economy right now. Uh, we're uh, about 1.1 percent of the gross domestic product when you, when you kind of sort it all out. Now having said that, uh, we've, we've taken a look at the 800 pages and it's a significant bill. And I must admit, one that does not uh, uh, include long-term care reform as a reform. At the same time, it includes a whole bunch of stuff that has uh, impact on us. Um, and let me try to synthesize a little bit of the comments. First, uh, uh, as, as we move forward and try to do a better job in terms of quality, it's really important for us to have economic stability. And one of the things we find in the bill is we have three pretty big problems with it. First of all, uh, the bill has a provision that would uh, institutionalize what the CMS is doing to cut 3.3 percent out of our Medicare rate based on a formulary mistake that was made by them uh, four years ago. Uh, secondly, we're concerned about the discussion draft 
that uh, will eliminate a part of the market basket. And so what we're looking at then is not only a 3.3 percent cut in our rate coming from CMS, but then an additional cut coming from, uh, from the committee that would significantly take resources out in terms of our ability to pay. And as you know, we are uh, uh, two-thirds to three-quarters percent or uh, uh, 25, 75 percent labor-based. And so a significant reduction in, in re reimbursement causes us an, a, big, a big problem in terms of our ability to pay uh, and keep staff. A uh, third, which is not your doing, but uh, Medicare cuts are being considered at the same time we're looking at uh, what we call the unfortunate reality of Medicaid underfunding. Uh, what we have seen, the stimulus package was, was a help. However, uh, the, the, in response to the recession, we see 46 percent of the states are freezing or cutting nursing home rates and that the 75 percent are not keeping up with inflation. So in, in the shortfall or in, 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 a, in a short statement, what's occurring is that we're looking at, we're looking down the barrel of, of, uh, of, uh, of a Medicare cut and at the same time we're looking across the country of Medicaid rates either staying stable or falling in a period of inflation. And so we're, we're feeling caught in, a, in, an, in an economic vice, if you will. Now let me talk a little bit about some other stuff that is, that is uh, I would say, uh, uh, very positive. Uh, regarding uh, Part B, we applaud you for the, uh, uh, the, the proposing to extend the therapy cap extension process, exception process. Second, uh, I, think the, I think in testimony earlier we talked about Medicare rehospitalization. We have a rehospitalization problem and we need to jointly re uh, address that issue. We, uh, we think there are ways to do that. In, in, a, in a short statement, we, we find that our rehospitalization comes on day two, three, and four of admission. And typically they go back to the hospital because we probably shouldn't have taken or they come on the weekend or, or, or things of that nature. So we think we should continue to work on that together. A third, uh, we think that uh, we should be looking at the whole post-acute setting and trying to integrate that much better than it is now. And we have numbers that would show that if we, uh, uh, either on a pilot or demonstration basis, I don't care from what you were talking about before, but we, we find that if, if we would integrate uh, and pay based on, on a diagnosis, not on site, we can save multi-billion dollars, uh, ranging above $50 billion over the next 10 years. And that's simply stated is that we can take a, a knee or a hip uh, that is not an IRF but in a nursing home and do it for about half the cost. Um, I, would be, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't respond a little bit to a hundred pages of your bill that was addressed somewhat uh, earlier by, uh, uh, by the, the prior panel that talks about um, uh, transparency in, in long-term care. Very, very basically put, the question is, is that, is that uh, what we need to do is uh, take a lot better look at who owns places, how they're owned, uh, who makes the decisions. We've been in discussions with the staff for about the last 18 months. And frankly, we support the concept and the direction of the committee, and we believe firmly that by con continuing to work together, uh, the final legislation that we can parse together, we can, we can absolutely support. I would say there are a few specifics, though, that uh, I'd say I'd be remiss if I didn't say that, that we have a problem with. First, we have a difficult time with what's a disclosable party. And, and, and in the bill itself, for example, it, it mentions that we should be disclosing uh, our bankers' boards of directors. That's something we really don't have or can't get to. Uh, secondly, uh, we, we would suggest the provisions that, uh, that you're looking at be tailored to uh, uh, talk about exactly who we want to disclose. Uh, we take a look at the bill and, and we're in the position of disclosing people like uh, who, we lands who our landscapers are, painters are, and things of that nature that don't have a significant amount. So we think we can work that out. Third, uh, we heard a lot about compliance programs from the Inspector General. We have no problem with compliance programs, but what we need is ta tailor those based on the size of the facility. Uh, a, a, a compliance program for Kindred Healthcare that's the largest in the country versus a compliance program for a 35-bed facility in Oakland are two different things. So we just need to be uh, sympathetic as to what those are. I had a, you're a minute over. Oh. Yeah, by uh, a minute. Well, then let me say this. Uh, thank you very much for letting us be here. Uh, we certainly want to work together, and there's some great things in, in the, uh, the workforce area and that, and, and as the transparency stuff, uh, we're here to make it work for you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Ms. <laughs> Ms. Fox. Oh, sorry. Thank you very much, Chairman Pallone, <clears throat> Ranking Member Deal, and other members of the committee. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. 
Blue Cross Blue Shield plans strongly support enactment of health reform. We must rein in costs, improve, improve quality, and importantly, we must cover everyone. Today, the Blue System provides coverage to more than 100 million people in every community and every zip code in this country. For the past two years, we have been supporting five key steps to reform our system. First, we believe Congress should encourage research on what treatments work best by establishing a comparative effectiveness research institute. We are very pleased the House draft bill recognizes the importance of this key step. Second, in order to attack rising costs, we must change the incentives in the payment systems, both private and in Medicare, to promote better care instead of just more services. The draft bill includes some of the Medicare delivery system recommendations we support. We also agree with provisions in the bill to help build an adequate medical workforce to care for everyone in the country. Third, consumers and providers should be empowered with information and tools to make more informed decisions. Fourth, we need to promote health and wellness and prevention and manage care for those with chronic illnesses. Finally, we believe a combination of public and private coverage solutions are needed to make sure everyone is covered. We support a new individual responsibility program for all Americans to obtain coverage along with subsidies to ensure coverage is affordable. We also support expanding Medicaid to cover everyone in poverty. We are also supporting major reforms in our own industry, including new federal rules to require insurers to open the doors, accept everyone, regardless of pre-existing conditions, and eliminate the practice of, of varying premium, premiums based upon health status. And we also support a national system of state exchanges to make it easier for individuals and small employers um, to purchase coverage. I know there is a perception that this is a new position for the insurance industry. It's not for the blue system. We had the same position in 1993. Um, we appreciate this opportunity to comment on the tri-committee bill. We support the broad framework of the bill, which includes many of the critical steps we believe are needed. However, we have very strong concerns that specific provisions will have serious unintended consequences that will undermine the committee's goals. <clears throat> Our chief concern is creation of a new government-run health program. We believe a government-run health program is unnecessary in for reform and will be very problematic for three reasons. First, many people are likely to lose the private coverage they like and be shifted into the government plan. This is because the government plan will have many price advantage, advantages that private plans won't, um, including paying much lower Medicare rates than the private sector. This is an enormous advantage on its own, as Medicare rates are already 20 to 30 percent lower than what we pay in the private side, and that's a national average. I think here you heard Marshfield Clinic talk about um, much huger variations um, in Wisconsin. But there are other advantages in the bill as well. I'll give you two examples. Individuals in the government plan, they can only sue in federal court for the denied services. However, individuals in private plans can sue in state court for punitive, compensatory, and other damages. In addition, private plans would have to meet 1,800 separate state benefit and provider requirements, while the government plan would not. Second, the draft bill would underpay providers in the government plan. This is likely to lead to major access issues in the healthcare system, such as long waits for services. And third, the government plan would undermine much needed delivery system reforms that are critical to controlling costs. We agree Medicare needs to be reformed to reward high quality care. We commend the committees for including reforms to modernize Medicare. However, history has shown the government can be slow to innovate and implement changes due to the complex legislative and regulatory processes. The private sector, on the other hand, is free to innovate. And let me just give you one example um, from our program that is improving outcomes and lowering costs through our Blue Distinction Centers of Excellence. Recent data shows that readmission rates 
at our cardiac care centers around the country are, have 26 to 37 percent lower readmission rates than other hospitals. In closing, I would like to emphasize the blue system's strong support for health care reform, including major changes in how insurers do business today. We believe the federal government has a vital and an expanded role to play in reform by expanding Medicaid to cover everyone in poverty and enrolling all the people that are now eligible um, for Medicaid coverage. By reforming Medicare to pay for quality and assuring Medicare's long-term solvency and setting strict new rules for insurers to assure access to everyone regardless of, of their health. We are committed to working with all of you to enact meaningful health care reform this year. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Fox.